Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this Northwest Ca uh, China Council, China Chat, the second in our book talk series for 2022. I'm Jim Mockford, president of the board of directors of the Northwest China Council. And helping us coordinate and produce the event this evening is John Wong, our executive director. We are in webinar format, and I will urge people to participate through the chat line or in the Q&A uh, line that's at the bottom of your screen for questions. And before I introduce our, our uh, I guess speaker, I'll allow a few more people to be uh, joining us from the waiting area. The Northwest China Council is an educational nonprofit uh, based in Portland, Oregon, founded in 1980 with a grant from the Asia Society in New York uh, to promote greater cultural understanding between the US and China. We offer Mandarin classes online, uh, we have China Chats and other events. And this past year, we received a grant from the Oregon Community Foundation to support our program during the pandemic. So we do wish to thank them and all of our corporate members and all of our members for their support. Uh, I wanna uh, let you know that the Q&A session uh, is something that I will field questions for. So please enter questions at any time in, in the uh, Q&A line and we will pick up those questions at the end of tonight's lecture. So let me now introduce the author of this book. <laughs> and uh, it's been a great pleasure to get to know Daniel online and have him here uh, on Zoom this evening. He is a graduate of the Air Force Academy. He is a US Air Force uh, Wing Operations Center flight commander at Herbert Field in Florida. And for over 12 years has had extensive experience in missions and deployment of aircraft uh, to overseas combat theaters. He's also an uh, a historian, excuse me, I'm uh, taking this up here. <clears throat> He's a historian and author who has written a number of books, The Forgotten Squadron, the 449th Fighter Squadron in World War II, a book, A Famine, Sword and Fire, The Liberation of Southwest China in World War II, and tonight's book, Fallen Tigers, America's Missing Airmen in China During World War II. He's joining us this evening from Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Thank you for your time at your late hour, Daniel. And let me hand off the talk to you. Thanks, Jim. And, and thanks, Jim and John, for uh, setting this up. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys tonight. Uh, we'll uh, just jump right into it here. Uh, like Jim said, I. Uh, wrote, uh, I've written a few books about World War II in China, specifically having to do with the uh, US uh, air war in China during the war, and uh, ended up leading to this most recent book, which came out last May called Fallen Tigers, which really goes into the experience of those airmen who were uh, downed over China, whether it was due to enemy fire or, or other reasons, and really what happened to them. And uh, what I wanted to do with that history was one of the things that I had noted in researching this area of history was how anecdotal everything was. There were a lot of uh, little memoirs here or there, but there's nothing that really laid it out uh, in the aggregate of what the big picture was. And so it was really hard to determine, especially since it had become so parochial and politicized to a degree where you had your pro Stillwell advocates, your pro Chanel advocates, you had the uh, the history from the perspective of the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek. You had the history from the perspective of the communists and Mao Zedong. And, and so it was really uh, a lot of partisan history that made it hard to see what the actual uh, events were that took place and what was the truth of the matter. Uh, and so what was really interesting was to look through the lens of these guys that uh, uh, ended up behind enemy lines all across China, these U.S. airmen, uh, because we had all these reports, both evasion reports, missing aircraft reports, and everything like that, that told us what their experience was during the war and the people that they encountered and what the conditions on the ground actually were like without any of that uh, politicized lens or mythologizing lens, because these were just wartime reports that were supposed to help your fellow airmen if they ended up in similar circumstances as you did. And so the, the purpose of the book was to go through all of these reports and kind of aggregate out what was the big picture that, uh, what, what was the big picture of wartime China? Uh, what was it actually like, stripped of all these uh, post-war uh, 
uh, frames that we put it inside. And so those are the questions that I went into the book asking. Uh, just to introduce myself and uh, where I come from uh, and where my research comes from. So I grew up in Colorado. Uh, my job right now, I'm actually a combat aviation advisor. So my job is to go to various uh, U.S. Uh, partners and allies and help operationalize their air power. Um, so uh, working with them on uh, on uh, surveillance and, and strike aircraft and, and uh, operationalizing their air power. Um, I have an MA in history. I'm going to be actually going back to grad school this fall to start working on a PhD uh, for the Air Force. Uh, I was a graduate of Euronado uh, pilot training in, in Texas where I flew the T-38 and then went to Air Force Special Operations Command where I flew the U-28 and now fly uh, various airplanes including the uh, uh, Cessna Caravan, the uh, Super Cub, the uh, Pilatus Porter, uh, etc. In, in that training role. Uh, as far as my research is concerned, I minored in Mandarin Chinese for my undergrad. And so I did uh, several trips while I was in, uh, in my undergrad program uh, to China and then have been there since then. And 2017 was the most recent uh, actually doing this research, getting to talk uh, to Chinese veterans and war survivors uh, and gain their perspective, uh, which I think was really crucial to fuse with the American perspective, which I think in, in most of the English language literature is almost exclusively uh, from the American perspective. Uh, so that was really valuable. And then uh, I've also done some research in Thailand uh, where we were able to kind of put some of this research to, to use uh, in searching for MIAs. So we'll talk about that a little later. And then uh, I've also, for my job, ended up uh, learning Tagalog and uh, we'll be doing uh, research in the, uh, the Philippines and, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia for my future dissertation work. So that's who I am. Um, I think it's really important to kind of set the stage for World War II in China prior to American involvement. It's really interesting because when Americans think of World War II, we typically think uh, from the perspective of the European conflict. That's what people know best. They know uh, the Normandy invasions. They know the battle across France and uh, into Germany. And, and that's most of the connection that people have to it. And then secondarily from that, they, uh, they know about uh, the North Africa invasion. And uh, that has just kind of lodged more solidly in the psyche of people. If they do know stuff about the Pacific War, the war against Japan, uh, they know about Iwo Jima and maybe Guadalcanal and, and some of the famous marine battles um, in the Pacific, but very uh, much further down the list is the war on the Asian continent itself and specifically in China. And what's ironic about that is that China is actually what brought the United States into World War II. It was our China policy that brought us into conflict with Japan that prompted Japan to attack us at Pearl Harbor that ended up bringing us into the war, not just with Japan, but with Germany and Italy uh, in Europe as well. Uh, and so what we'd seen, and I'm not gonna go into the, the deep history of this, but essentially uh, following the uh, onset of the Great Depression, you have these authoritarian regimes that pop up all over the world and really try and prevent another Great Depression by uh, setting up kind of economic spheres of influence. And so you've got Germany and Italy doing that over in Europe and uh, Africa, Italy invades Ethiopia, is trying to set up these, th these kind of colonies where they can perform resource extraction and set up markets for their manufactured goods uh, that is insulated from world markets so that they won't be subject to the ravages of another Great Depression. And Japan starts to do likewise in the Pacific. And what you see uh, is that uh, they'd already uh, colonized various parts like the, the island of Taiwan. They'd taken during the uh, first Sino-Japanese War in, in the 1890s. Uh, in the early 20th century, they take Korea. And then in the uh, early 1930s, they start pushing into China, specifically in northeast China, which is known as uh, Manchuria at the time, and uh, end up setting up a, a puppet state there under the uh, former emperor of China, Puyi. And so they're basically expanding this influence. And in 1937, they use uh, kind of a trumped up uh, charge of a missing Japanese soldier uh, 
uh, to start pushing south of the Great Wall into uh, the uh, the northern plains of, of China from uh, what is now Beijing, and at the time was called Peiping. And uh, so essentially what happens is, is this is the setup, right? This is, uh, this is the international situation. And the United States at the time had a perspective where we wanted to keep China open to American trade. Uh, and we wanted both to be able to uh, receive resources from them, but also uh, for their huge market with their, at the time, 400 million people uh, to be able to be a market for American goods. And so we had an, what we called the open door policy, where we insisted that everybody have equal uh, uh, representation in China trade. And so it was against our national interest to allow it to become an exclusive zone for Japanese domination. And so we started piling on the same kind of words that you hear now with uh, the conflict in Ukraine, we started piling on sanctions. Uh, and essentially the sanctions got to the point with oil and steel embargoes where the Japanese calculated that essentially they could uh, keep going on the path that they were going, uh, but they would have to essentially fight a war now. Uh, it essentially forced their hands to fight a war now uh, or, or back down. Uh, and so they chose to fight rather than back down and, and their way of initiating that fight was at Pearl Harbor. They calculated that if they crippled the uh, US fleet in uh, the Pacific, they'd be able to expand into Southeast Asia, open up those resources to them, and be able to build a solid enough defensive perimeter by the time America could get back out there, that America would come to some negotiated settlement that would uh, get them what they wanted in terms of their exclusive zone in the Pacific. And so uh, while this is all going on in the lead up to, uh, to Pearl Harbor, we have a lot of people that have a vested interest in the United States being involved in, in China, uh, in the United States keeping open trade to China, that are actually pumping a lot of these stories of the Japanese invasion into uh, the American press. And so actually there was a lot more consciousness before the war of what was going on in China than once the war gets started and we, we kind of gain this European primacy to our viewpoint of it. And this uh, photo is, is a prime example of that. This is a child at the uh, Shanghai Railroad Station during, uh, well, I guess after a Japanese bombing raid uh, that kind of went viral in the, the modern parlance across America uh, in the, the uh, 1937 as the Japanese are invading uh, Shanghai and up the Yangtze River towards Nanjing. Uh, and so this is the kind of stuff that's driving American policy and American perceptions of what's going on in, in uh, China at the time. So what you see, is uh, as we go forward, you know, we've got the Marco Polo Bridge incident, which is the excuse to get the war going. Uh, Beiping is captured in August, Shanghai in November after bloody street to street battles. December, Nanjing is captured, after which, you know, the Japanese troops just go on a frustrated rampage and uh, hundreds of thousands of people are killed. Uh, and they keep driving up the Yangtze River towards Wuhan in uh, October of 1938. Uh, and then in 1939, things finally start to bog down and the Japanese start to lose their forward momentum with the Battle of Changsha. There actually ended up being three battles of Changsha up through 1942, and each time the Japanese advance, they're beaten back. And so what we get to in uh, the, uh, it, basically in 1940 is this stalemate that's developed in China. Uh, the Japanese have advanced up the Yangtze River to uh, Wuhan. They've taken the North China Plains. Uh, they control French Indochina. Uh, they control Taiwan. They control most of the ports along the eastern coast. Uh, they control Korea. And so essentially, China is blockaded with only one route for supplies left into the country, and that is through British-controlled Burma over a uh, little roadway that is... Uh, uh, pretty insufficient to keep an entire nation going, but they're only lifeline to the outside world. And that's the situation that uh, they end up with in 1940. And, and so really to try and break this stalemate, uh, Japan turns to air power. And so starting in uh, really May, well, a little bit through 1939, but really starts becoming much heavier in 1940, these giant bombing raids on Chongqing, which is the wartime uh, 
Chinese capital deep in Sichuan province. The Japanese troops can't make it there because they're stalemated uh, further up the Yangtze Valley or further down the, the valley. But the Japanese can send fleets of hundreds of bombers um, to those cities, to all the cities of, of what comes to be called free China, just trying to pummel the Chinese into submission. They calculate that they can just break the Chinese will and have them finally submit. And so that's that's what's going on, just these massive bombing raids. The Chinese have a small air force that they've built up over the years, but it's a real hodgepodge. Uh, it's, it's definitely a third world air force of just various types of, of Italian, American, Russian airplanes. Uh, they have some assistance from the Russians for a little while until uh, 1940 when the, the Russians withdraw after an agreement with the Japanese. Um, and so, you know, they don't have a strong air force. And in August of 1940, whatever strength there was in that air force is just wiped out when the Japanese introduced their new A6M Zero fighter. Uh, and in its combat debut, they shot down 13 Chinese planes in a dogfight over Chongqing with a loss of zero Japanese fighters. And it just basically just wipes the floor with them and completely achieves air dominance. Um, and in fact, there was a uh, Chinese uh, veteran that I interviewed, Luo Chutsai, who said, uh, the Japanese fighters and bombers never stopped attacking us. I remember a Japanese fighter that flew low enough for me to see the pilot's face. If I threw a rock at the airplane, I think it would have likely hit it. The Japanese were unopposed wherever they flew. And so we have this situation in 1940 where the, the Japanese have completely wrested air superiority from the Chinese. They control China's skies, they control its industry, they control its finances, its most uh, fertile lands, they control its ports. Uh, and so China's in a bad way. Morale is in the tubes and Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of nationalist China, uh, is fairly desperate to uh, do anything that'll that'll make progress and so in 1940 he turns to an advisor of his claire chenault uh, with an idea to create a uh, volunteer group and chenault's an interesting character because here's a guy that uh, you know he got into the u.s army during world war one uh, really wanted to be a pilot kept asking to go to pilot training kept getting told no and finally ends up going and uh, graduates as a pilot does not serve in the war but ends up after the war becoming a big advocate for pursuit aviation, which we would call fighter aviation now. Uh, and this is at a time when the uh, Army Air Corps is struggling to survive in the budget environment of, uh, you know, post-World War I and then especially into the Great Depression of uh, real fiscal austerity. And he's advocating for fighter aircraft when the entire Army Air Corps is advocating for bombers and claiming that bombers will be able to single-handedly win future wars. Uh, and so it doesn't make him very popular in the Air Corps. And so in 1936, uh, first of all, he was a prolific smoker uh, going through a couple of packs of camels a day. And uh, so he had quite a few health problems anyways. And then lots of flying time in open cockpit biplanes. So his hearing sucked. And you can see that uh, he probably didn't use the best skin products in the world. And so uh, he ends up getting kind of forced to retire at the lofty rank of captain in 1936 and is immediately offered a job uh, to basically assess the Chinese Air Force on behalf of the Changs and provide his recommendations. And so he actually shows up in China in May of 1937, literally six weeks before the Japanese uh, begin their next phase of the war with the Marco Polo Bridge incident. And he's got like eight kids and a wife back in Louisiana. Uh, and part of the reason that he took the job is that it paid so much more than his uh, service salary back as a, as a captain in the Air Corps. And uh, he recognizes this opportunity as soon as the thing kicks off, which is an opportunity to really prove his ideas in combat. And so he convinces Chiang Kai-shek to let him build this warning network and directs his fighter forces in the early battles of the war. And it actually works pretty well. He builds a warning network of spotters around the capital of, of uh, Nanjing. And they actually direct these kind of obsolete uh, Chinese biplanes to a number of successful intercepts to where they end up claiming like 54 
Japanese bombers destroyed in just three days. The only problem being that then the Japanese start sending fighter escorts and those fighters are so much better than the Chinese fighters that everything just kind of collapses. Um, but the idea in Schnault's mind at least was proven that with a well-directed fighter force, uh, you could defeat an enemy uh, air force many times your size. Uh, and so in the intervening time, he kind of spearheads this plan to kind of expand that network all throughout China. And even as China has no air force for all intents and purposes, uh, he's building this warning network and this warning network is still providing air raid warnings so people can get to shelter and out of harm's way as the Japanese bombers are droning overhead. Uh, and then he's also building this network of airfields, eventually over a hundred of them all throughout China for a country that doesn't have an air force. It was really fascinating kind of article of faith that he was acting on that there would be this eventual air war in China, which there was, and his preparation ended up being key to it. But in uh, November of 1940, Chiang Kai-shek ends up sending him to the United States. And this is happening amid all of this, these escalating um, sanctions and everything. Chiang kind of calculates, and his brother-in-law is, is a TV song, uh, is acting as his lobbyist in Washington, DC, basically, calculates that they'll be able to get an American volunteer group. And so he sends Schnault as kind of the technical expert of that. And Schnault is able to convince the Roosevelt administration to sign off on this, although there actually is no physical sign off. It's kind of a verbal agreement so as to avoid any sort of attribution, because obviously sending <laughs> uh, service members that you allow to resign um, to go fight in a war against somebody that you're not you know, engaged in, in a declared conflict with is uh, pretty legally dubious. So they made sure to maintain as much uh, deniability as possible. And so what you have is in uh, 1941, uh, 100 obsolescent P-40 uh, Tomahawks and uh, 100 ex-U.S. service members who were promised to be able to leave the service, go serve in the volunteer group, and then return to the service with no loss in uh, time and grade or, or anything like that. Uh, and then about 200 uh, ground crewmen also recruited from the military services, pretty evenly split between the uh, Navy, the Marine Corps, and the U.S. Army Air Forces. And they end up in uh, training in Burma and then going to war both uh, in China and Burma, but not <laughs> conveniently enough legally, not until after Pearl Harbor. Uh, because their training as all this other context is happening and the, and the embargoes are going into place. And so Japan ends up uh, striking Pearl Harbor before they end up in combat, uh, which makes all the legal uh, issues moot in the end. They end up going into combat uh, a couple weeks later on December 20th over the city of Kunming in southwest China, which is one of the cities that the Japanese had been bombing pretty relentlessly. And... Uh, they end up being wildly successful tactically. They uh, achieve an incredible kill ratio uh, over the Japanese, whether you believe the uh, kill ratio that they claimed or the, the uh, later revisions that some historians have believed. Um, worst case, they're doing seven or eight to one kill ratio, which is pretty incredible. Um, and it, in fact, it was quite embarrassing to the Army Air Forces, whose regular units were doing really poorly in the Philippines and elsewhere in the early days of the war. Uh, so they end up becoming uh, this kind of symbol of, of what a, America is capable of, even though they're acting outside the service in the early days of the war. And so it ends up being this huge propaganda victory, even though the Japanese are successful in rolling back the defense of Burma and end up completely cutting off China from any land or sea lines of communication. And in fact, from then on, until the end of the war, uh, until the last six months of the war, the only lines of communication into China is by air transport over the mountains from India in a very hazardous um, airlift called the hump after the hump of mountains that was between India and China. But uh, for the Chinese people, um, you know, the Americans really conceived of those shark mouths on those P-40s as having the symbolic value of, of revenge for Pearl Harbor. Uh, 
you know, and, and that's kind of what it still means to Americans today. In China, it meant something completely different because after having, uh, you know, the stuffing kicked out of them for years, really, they've been at war against the Japanese for like, uh, what we're talking about, like, you know, three and a half years at that point. Um, actually even more so like four years so essentially they'd already been at war with japan for as long as america would eventually be at war in world war ii and so it was kind of twice as long for china so you can imagine them just getting the stuffing kicked out of them for all this time and suddenly uh they're able to roll that back and protect their cities from japanese bombing because of these uh, american volunteers that came and so Lu Tsaiwen, another uh chinese veteran that i interviewed uh put it so succinctly he said the japanese had full advantage in the air they're extremely arrogant. They occupied the entire sky. The sky was entirely their territory. After the flying tigers came, the sky was our territory. So it, it's interesting the value, the, the very real emotional capital that these guys built up uh, with the Chinese. And what's even more interesting is that you have this war that had been stalemated for years now and would remain stalemated on the ground really until uh, 1944 when the Japanese end up kicking off this enormous offensive uh, throughout central China. Uh, and so the only real uh, action against the Japanese occupiers that millions of Chinese saw were American airplanes. Uh, fighting back against them. And so that's the backdrop of, of this research to find out what happened to these guys when they bailed out of their planes when they were shot down uh, is the uh, extreme devotion that a lot of uh, Chinese ended up feeling towards them. And so as I went through these reports, I'll show you a couple of graphs here. I won't get too deep into them, but it was very interesting to see what was actually bringing these aircraft down because I think in our popular conception, when we think of World War II and we think of the danger faced by uh, our aircraft, I think typically we think of dogfights and, and fighter on fighter battles as, as downing a lot of these guys, but you can see that overwhelmingly the number one cause for uh, uh, not making it back to your base was enemy surface fire, as in anti-aircraft fire, uh, whether that was large caliber or small caliber or uh, naval guns, that was the number one danger. and so. More often than not, these guys were being brought down by surface fire while they were doing strafing runs, while they were making bombing attacks, uh, not by enemy aircraft. Enemy aircraft was the, the next biggest category, but almost on par with weather. Uh, you were about as likely to be brought down by bad weather in an environment that didn't have instrument navigation or other things like that. Uh, plus the terrain, especially in a lot of parts of China is very mountainous. And so you combine that with no instruments, uh, no instrument approaches, uh, bad weather, bad terrain, um, mountainous terrain, made for a pretty deadly combination. And then you can see the other uh, uh, incidents that would cause people to uh, be reported missing, whether it was accidents, mechanical malfunction, navigation error. Uh, and then we have a hefty portion that we just don't know what happened to them because uh, it, they just didn't make it back and we're not quite sure why. Uh, but what was really interesting, too, was uh, looking at what types of aircraft were brought down. I think if we were to imagine what aircraft we think would be brought down more than any other, uh, we'd probably say something like the uh, P-40 Warhawks, since they were so prolific there. But uh, you can see that the P-40 numbers are actually about on par with the P-51. And actually, it turns out that more P-51 Mustangs were lost in China than any other type of aircraft. And overwhelmingly, they were brought down by surface fire. It turns out that the P-51, which a lot of Americans think of as the wonder fighter of World War II, was actually a pretty great fighter aircraft for air-to-air -air fighting, but actually a really crappy attack plane in that it was incredibly vulnerable to ground fire. And if you think about it on, on that airplane, you know, you look at a, a, a P-40 and it's got that big distinctive jaw that made those shark teeth look so great. Uh, that's where the oil cooler and the, uh, the, the coolant uh, intake is for the air there. Uh, it's all in one compact spot. And so if you wanted to shoot it in the coolant, which is the most vulnerable part of a liquid cooled engine, 
you'd have to shoot at it from a front aspect, which means it can also it's also shooting back at you with its 650 cals. But the P51 with its uh, radiator scoop underneath the cockpit and oil and coolant lines going the whole length of the underbelly was just super vulnerable because you could wait until the strafing run was over and then stand up and, and shoot at that thing as it was flying away. And really from any aspect, as long as you hit it in one of those uh, coolant lines, it'd have about two more minutes of flying time and that'd be it. The, guy would have, the engine would seize and the guy would have to bail out. Uh, and so it was a very common story uh, was for those guys to be on a strafing run and they'd finish the run and tunk, you know, feel the bullet hit and the engine uh, temperature would suddenly rise and they might see some smoke and then the engine would seize and they'd have to bail out. And uh, hopefully they'd have enough uh, energy to make it to a safe altitude. Now, I think probably the most surprising thing from doing this analysis was the breakdown of what happened to these guys. Because when you look at what happened in Europe, where we have this common perception of like the French and Belgian and Dutch undergrounds, kind of bravely rescuing airmen who were who were down in, in dogfights over Western Europe. And that's true. Uh, however, what's really interesting is, is to look at uh, the numbers. Like if you survive the crash or bailout, and it turns out that you're about 55% likely to die in a crash or bailout. And that was consistent uh, in Europe and in China. And that makes sense. Uh, aviation at the time is not very safe. And then in addition, if you're reported missing, it's probably because somebody's trying to kill you because this is a war and that really doesn't improve your odds. Uh, so you can see on this graph here, uh, killed and missing makes up about 55%. Uh, what's really interesting is in Europe, uh, if you survive the crash or bailout in Western Europe, you had about a 20% chance of being brought back to friendly lines by an underground organization and you had an 80% chance of being uh, shuffled off to a prisoner of war camp uh, by the Germans for most of the rest of the war. In China, what's pretty crazy is that if you survived the crash or bailout, you had a 90% chance of being brought back to an allied base. Essentially, if you didn't physically land on top of a Japanese soldier, you were probably not gonna end up as a prisoner of war. Um, it is insane, like out of uh, all of these 1,800 some people that were reported missing in the China theater, only 82 ended up as prisoners of war, which is nuts. Um, the vast majority of them were rescued. And what's crazy is that that didn't matter where you went down either. You know, if you, you look at this map here, you can see that especially after the period of the American Volunteer Group, when the US Army Air Forces replaced them and uh, became the China Air Task Force. And then in March, 1943, became the 14th Air Force. The air war really spreads across all of China. Uh, and so when I talk about like, you know, the average millions of Chinese people seeing uh, progress in the war exemplified or really only through American air action, like you can see how widespread that was. Uh, and you can see that uh, these little dots representing where folks were killed, where they were captured. Uh, roughly where they're still missing. Uh, but what's crazy is if you look at the rescued in the bottom right there, and you can see that people are landing in major population centers and still getting rescued. And in fact, one of the stories that I recount briefly in the book is about a guy who is strafing a Japanese airfield in Shanghai, takes a bullet to the radiator in his P-51, uh, bails out one mile from the Japanese air base. And so you can imagine these Japanese soldiers are like on the base, they just shot this guy down. They watch him bail out. They all pile into their truck to go drive up and roll him up. And by the time they get there, one mile away, the Chinese civilians there have already given him a uh, peasant garb and put him on the back of an ox cart and he is on his way back to friendly territory. And it was a long trip. This is gonna take him about two months to get back to friendly territory, but it was that fast. They were so, on a hair trigger to just help these guys. And what was really fascinating as I learned about these stories, both from the Chinese uh, war survivors and veterans and from the Americans, is that especially in the initial contact, these were just normal Chinese civilians. These were not like guerrillas who had been briefed or trained on this stuff. These were just normal people. A lot of them were just farmers or townspeople that, that just happened to meet these guys in first contact and just knew that 
and instantly felt a responsibility to remove them from harm's way and, and connect them with gorillas so they could get back to, to friendly territory. And so what you end up with is this really interesting grassroots interactions between these American airmen who are shot down and these Chinese civilians who really, this is probably their first encounter with an American ever uh, in almost every case. Uh, obviously they don't share language or anything like that. Um, it, but, uh, and, and they haven't seen any progress in the war besides air action for years. Uh, they've had no meaningful contact with their, with their purported government in Chongqing for years. Uh, but they feel this, this overwhelming affinity with these airmen and they feel this, this responsibility to help them. And so you, you end up having this thing that really cuts across political lines and geographic lines to become this, this kind of generalized phenomenon where regardless of whether they were communists, uh, nationalists, even folks that are technically aligned with the Japanese in uh, collaborationist regimes are still helping American airmen avoid the Japanese overwhelmingly. Uh, there was one group of US Navy airmen that were shot down in Hong Kong Harbor, rescued by the collaborationist Chinese that were <laughs> in league with the Japanese and actually smuggled out of the city and handed over to the nationalists. So it's a really interesting phenomenon that ends up taking place. Now, as I got into these stories, I, I was really wondering where a lot of this affinity came from. And one of the stories that was brought to my attention is uh, Bob Mooney, who is a fighter pilot in the 16th Fighter Squadron stationed at Yunnan Yi, which is about uh, 100 miles west of Kunming in Southwest China. And in uh, December, uh, December 26th of 1942, his squadron scrambled to oppose a Japanese bombing raid that was coming in. And he ends up squaring off with a Japanese fighter over this town of Shangyun. Uh, and they both hit each other in the head-to-head -head pass and both airplanes end up going down. The, the Japanese spins out of control and explodes and uh, Mooney finds his engine on fire. And what's crazy is that you have all the townspeople that are down below and they're just like, Riven to this, like watching this dogfight overhead, uh, their their town, and all of a sudden they see that his engine is on fire, and he rolls back the canopy, but he doesn't bail out of his airplane, because if he had bailed out at that point, the airplane would have just dropped into the town and killed a bunch of people, and so he waits until he glides clear of the town, and by the time he bails out, he's pretty low, uh, and so he ends up getting uh, mortally wounded and dies uh, several hours later. Uh, on the operating table. And uh, all that to say that the, the, the Chinese townspeople were like so touched this, that this guy prioritized their lives over his own when they would have been perfectly, uh, they would have celebrated him as a hero if he had bailed out and his, his plane crashed in the town and killed a dozen or two dozen or three dozen Chinese people. They still would have, would have uh, honored him as a hero for coming to China to fight the Japanese, but he stuck with his plane and he really, uh, his gesture of prioritizing their lives over his own really touched them to the point where they actually built this monument uh, near where he crashed. And in fact, that monument is there now. It was taken down in, during uh, the 1960s, but the townspeople ended up hiding the pieces. And so in the 90s, when it was kind of acceptable to put that stuff up again, they reestablished it and that monument is still there today. And, and I think that was the kind of feeling that generated the, the willingness to sacrifice in order to bring American airmen to safety that I found to be such a general phenomenon throughout this research. Uh, the last time I was in China in 2017, for example, I got to meet this guy, uh, Pei Hai Ching, who's actually a veteran of the Nationalist Army and was involved in, in several battles, including in the desperate fighting in 1942 as the Japanese are surging up from Burma and were fortunately stopped in Southwest China, but this guy's unit was just torn apart in some pretty vicious battles. And so he ended up deserting. He ends up deserting the battlefield. He ends up kind of uh, making his way to this uh, river valley along the Salween River. He decides that he's gonna be a fisherman just living by this river for the rest of his life. And uh, what's interesting is about a year later, Francis Forbes is on a uh, strafing run of a Japanese camp that's on the other side of the river, a couple miles away. Uh, he has a malfunction for, for one of his bombs, it explodes, detonates immediately, blows the wing off his fighter. Uh, he bails out, ends up evading on the Japanese side of the river for a few days, 
and then decides to try and make the crossing. And this river is very rapid and dangerous. It's this very narrow mountain river uh, that has very fast flow and it's very difficult to get across, but he's kind of out of options at this point. So he makes a go for it and ends up crossing right across from Pei Hai Ching's house. And Pei sees him struggling through the river, ends up uh, wading in and dragging him out. And, uh, and uh, Forbes ends up passing out on his, on his uh, porch there and, until the uh, nationalists come a few minutes later and, and cart him off. Uh, but what was really crazy is that uh, he had saved these, this guy's life. The whole encounter probably lasted only about five minutes from saving him to the nationalist uh, soldiers coming and taking him away. Never knew anything more about him, uh, but because of the, the research and, and the database that I built, we were able to connect him, uh, this veteran, with, the, uh, with Forbes' family. Um, and so they were able to express their gratitude and able to explain like the long and fruitful life that this guy was able to go live because uh, Mr. Pei uh, kind of put himself in peril as somebody that had already deserted the Nationalist Army was obviously feeling very hopeless about this whole enterprise, um, but still felt obligated to help this American. And, and I think that kind of shows the emotion and, and everything that's engendered by this uh, phenomenon. Um, as I went through this, I was able to kind of put this research to work in a way for two particular cases. And actually in 2017, the last time I was there, part of the reason I was there was to try and actually use this research to find some of the 400 plus MIAs that are still somewhere in China. And we had some good leads on, on a couple of folks, on a couple of crash sites. Uh, we were building partnerships with local Chinese organizations and uh trying to figure out where to go from there and then the trade war started very shortly after that after i got home from that trip and everything kind of fell apart but where one door closed another one opened and actually uh had i've been working with the royal thai air force museum and they ended up finding after a flood some some records which included a bunch of police reports to a couple of different uh crashes uh that happened there and so Japan, uh, Thailand at the time was actually allied with Japan. And so American airplanes from China, uh, from that same air base at Yunnan Yi, were actually making missions down into Northern Thailand to uh, interdict uh, Japanese supply lines that went through Thailand into Burma and uh, Southern China. And uh, so who you see on the screen here, Frank McKinney was a reconnaissance pilot and uh, he went missing on uh, November 5th 1944 on one of his reconnaissance missions and i knew really well his best friend um who was waiting for him back at the base and he just never got back these were all single plane missions that reconnaissance run covered 2000 uh, kilometers and who knows where he went down and there was another guy that went down just a week later on november 11th uh, henry minko who's a p-51 pilot and he actually went down on a fighter sweep of the same kind of areas that uh, McKinney was supposed to cover. Uh, there were 16 American fighters. They end up in a dog fight. You can see in the bottom right, these Japanese built uh, fighters, KI-27s, little fixed gear, obsolete fighters that the Japanese had given to the Thais. And he ends up shot down in a dog fight with Thai fighters uh, over Northern Thailand. And so there are these two cases of 14th Air Force Airmen that are still missing in action there. And actually, we were able to take those police reports uh, and find, uh, in the case of McKinney, Fong In Ma, who uh, at the time of this interview that you can see here is 97 years old. And you can see uh, Wayada Cantor Road, who's a, a school teacher in Northern Thailand acting as a translator. But uh, Fong actually witnessed the crash and so was actually able to take us to the crash site. And actually, just this week, um, uh, the uh, DPAA, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, uh, did an excavation of the site and actually found bones and teeth and the repatriation ceremony was on Wednesday. So those uh, remains are now on their way to Hawaii where hopefully uh, DNA testing will confirm that those are uh, Frank McKinney and, and he'll be uh, laid to rest finally after 75 plus years of being missing overseas. And likewise, we were able to use those police reports and local knowledge to uh, climb up into the mountains and find the wreckage of Henry Minko's P-51, uh, which hopefully will be prioritized for uh, excavation 
next year. It's a much harder site to access. So they did the, uh, the reconnaissance site first. It took us about two and a half hours just to go two and a half kilometers up into the mountains. And it was, uh, it was difficult, but you can see, uh, behind me there over on the left side of, of the group photo is a uh, Sakthane Promtep, who's the retired, uh, Royal Thai Air Force General Officer that actually found those reports. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty big victory to be able to do that. And then over on the top left photo, I'm standing with uh, Hack Hackinson, who is an American expat that lives in Chiang Mai, that was able to do a lot of the, the legwork to find some of these uh, these people that had either come across these sites over the years or, or had actually witnessed the crashes. Uh, so it was really interesting how the archival research that I had done and the research interviewing the veterans and everything kind of fused with the, the local archival research in the Royal Thai Air Force Museum, plus some on the ground work to find eyewitnesses to actually find where these guys were 75 years later. And so it worked on both the cases in Thailand uh, with one on the way back to Hawaii now and hopefully one next year uh, with another excavation and it shows what is possible if China opens up to this kind of uh, collaboration again. And I think, and I hope they will be. This is, these are pictures from Zhejiang in uh, Hunan province, where a 14th Air Force airfield actually occupied by the Chinese American Composite Wing, which was a joint Chinese American unit, uh, where Chinese pilots and mechanics and American pilots and mechanics and other air crew were flying side by side in combat together in an effort to build, uh, rebuild the Chinese Air Force during the war. And uh, you can see the, the control tower is still there. You can see the, the uh, jackets with the blood shit with the nationalist flag, and this is in the PRC. So there has been an effort since the kind of the mid nineties to rehabilitate this history and, uh, and reclaim it uh, in China. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that uh, cooperation will exist again in, in the near future. I hope to actually go and find some of these MIAs that are still over there and bring closure to uh, their families and kind of fulfill that promise that we have as Americans to, to bring people home. Uh, but that kind of brings us into some of the historical controversies that still plague this area of history. You know, we talked about the pro Stillwell, you know, uh, anti Chenault, pro Chenault, anti Stillwell. Uh, Mao perspective, Chiang Kai-shek perspective, and then on top of that, you have the who actually deserves to be a flying tiger, which uh, a lot of the American volunteer group veterans said that only they deserve to be called flying tigers, that the U.S. Army airmen that came after them didn't count. Uh, but then you have, you know, the actual patch of the 14th Air Force there, tiger with wings. I don't know, I guess tiger with wings doesn't equal flying tiger. And this is interesting evidence here on the left, because here you have something that says 14th U.S. Air Force Flying Tigers, and it's got Chenault's signature on it. And it seems like he'd probably be the authority on that. Uh, but it's still controversial today. There are still people that really rail against anybody besides the AVG being called Flying Tigers, even though to most Chinese veterans, um, to most Chinese veterans uh, and war survivors, any American airplane that they saw, they called the Flying Tigers. Uh, so that's one of the controversies that goes on. And then on, on the other side here, you see at this 80th anniversary of the Flying Tigers event, the uh, Chinese ambassador in Washington, D.C. donning a flight jacket. Uh, but what's really interesting is they've removed the China Burma India Theater patch from the left shoulder there because it has the nationalist China star on it, uh, they've removed it from the uniform. So it's kind of a, a red washing, if you will, of the history where they try and reclaim the history of the Flying Tigers, which, as we talked about, really cut across political lines. And so there is a valid case for that being like a, a Chinese social history rather than like a nationalist or communist political history of the war. Um, but here you have like this effort to kind of uh, cut out inconvenient parts of the history uh, in China's remembering of it, which has its own hazards, right? And, and also uh, is convenient towards modern political ends. So there are a lot of controversies in this history going forward, which kind of make it a minefield uh, for <laughs> both to, to get to cut to the truth of the matter, which, which I attempt to do in the book, but also just to generate cooperation on uh, modern issues between the United States and China, uh, 
you know, there's a lot of potential for cooperation between uh, the, uh, the United States and China and between China and Taiwan, frankly, on this shared history that they have. Um, but as long as people are being kind of exclusive over who gets to claim the history and cutting out the inconvenient parts, it makes it really difficult to actually achieve that. Um, so with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm not ready for questions. I just want to hear more. But I want to say to those watching, this is a fantastic book. And I was an early person to go uh, buy one of these from the University of Kentucky Press because I got a patch. Remember when you sent out patches to encourage people to buy your book? And, uh, you know, for those of us who have been members of Northwest China Council for some time, you may recall that the Northwest China Council sponsored, uh, thanks to our former board member Ann Weatherall and others, a major conference here in Portland about 10 years ago and an exhibit at the Multnomah County Library. And we have a lot of people here locally who have a strong interest in this story because of family members or people they know who were involved in uh, this story, uh, you know, already, what, 75 plus years ago. And yet, uh, if you go to the back of this book and look at the chronology, you're going to have to add some more dates as these stories continue and you're bringing home people whose stories are becoming completed uh, thanks to the efforts of, of people in the field. Uh, so it's really, really a current story as well as a story of the past. And uh, anyway, I'm really thankful that you're here today. I do have questions for you. They're in the Q&A line. And um, I will ask them in no particular order. <laughs> but we have a question or two actually from Craig McCory here, which the first question I'm reading from him is, um, did the Americans ever have secret talks with the British about using Hong Kong as an airbase for the Flying Tigers? So, um, sort of. Hong Kong was always used as kind of a, there was a lot of supplies that came through Hong Kong. Um, various administrative personnel would fly, uh, take like the Pan Am Clipper into Hong Kong and then catch a CNAC flight into the interior of China. So it was always kind of a trafficking hub, if you will, for, for that activity, but there was never really serious discussion of using it for an anti-Japanese base uh, prior to hostilities kicking off. And, and I think the reason for that is fairly obvious. It would have uh, opened up Britain to retaliatory action. Uh, by the time Britain was at war with Japan and America was also at war with Japan, uh, obviously, Hong Kong was overrun pretty quickly, and so it was no longer really an option. And, I, and I'll follow that with his second question was, um, since the Flying Tigers were working with the KMT, what was the Communist Party response to this collaboration? So one of the things that I get into a lot in the book is kind of the ad hoc uh, enemy of my enemy alliance that we end up with the communists, especially towards the end of the war. And so actually cooperation with the communists was really good with uh, with the 14th Air Force and the 20th Air Force flying B-29s uh, across northern China to strike Japan and uh, targets in Manchuria. And so uh, it ends up being uh, pretty solid, uh, at least 80 some odd American airmen rescued by communist troops. Uh, uh, one of the central stories in the book, Glenn Benita, was uh, the first one rescued by the uh, communist New Fourth Army. Uh, when he went down north of the Yangtze River. Um, so yeah, they actually played a fairly good role. In fact, uh, one of the surviving uh, veterans, uh, Paul Crawford, who lives up in Atlanta, uh, he was a P-51 pilot and uh, shot down by ground fire in Northern China. And he actually uh, was at a breakfast with Mao Zedong after he was rescued. Uh, he got to meet him. So um, it, there was always some tension to that relationship but uh, as you'd expect, and there was never anything formally put down, uh, formalizing it, but it was a good relationship. And the Americans that were rescued by those guys were very grateful. And again, it goes back to that kind of grassroots interaction that was happening uh, on, in the field, um, whether it was nationalists, communists, unaligned people, uh, collaborators, local unaligned guerrilla groups, uh, it didn't matter, uh, people by and large, Overwhelmingly, 90% were willing to uh, 
to do what they had to to get those Americans back to friendly territory. Um, I'm going to ask a question from uh, one of our attendees that relates to the museum in Chongqing. But I also want to mention that we're moving to a conversation about museums, that our Portland Chinatown Museum from time to time has had some exhibits uh, that are worth seeing that relate to this story. And naturally, we'd like to encourage them to do another one sometime. The question I have here is, um, do you think the Flying Tigers Museum in Chongqing is a fair representation of the events or is it a pro-American uh, lens that you see at that museum? And I, I assume you've been there. Uh, and, and actually to add to that, you might let us know any other museums we might wanna try and see in China that have part of this story uh, on exhibit. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've been to several museums in, in China that cover this kind of history. I've not been to the Chongqing Museum yet, so I can't answer that specifically, but I've been to the one in Guilin, I've been to the one in Kunming, the one in Zhejiang. Uh, there's a museum uh, in Tengchong, which is a walled city that was part of a, a, a big battle, joint Chinese-American battle in 1944. Uh, that's pretty fantastic. I will say that all of these museums are uh, through the lens of the Chinese perspective. Uh, and so they're not particularly, and not that they should be, but they're not particularly flattering towards Japan, for example. Uh, and they don't really make an attempt to be neutral in that vein. And, and I think that's pretty understandable to most people that know the history. There's still a lot of emotion there. Um, the America stuff is mixed. Um, I would say that overall, there's, uh, especially the ones that focus on, on the uh, Flying Tigers specifically, they're fairly complimentary, but it's interesting. Some of the little uh, um, barbs that uh, get worked in there every once in a while. And so as with any kind of material, you know, you gotta be a critical consumer of information and just think of uh, the perspective that it's coming from. But I think on the whole, uh, it's been a positive development that they're willing to take a look at that history again after so many decades of, of it being a taboo subject. So whereas it's not perfect yet, um, and I'm, and uh, probably the last five years, uh, it's really stagnated. But in the broad sweep, over, you know, since the mid '90s, it's made a lot of progress over there for sure. Okay, I, I do have a, a few more questions. Um, let's see here um, from Michael. Um, were the uh, blood chips the reason that so many flying tigers were rescued? So actually, it's interesting because um, we didn't end up talking a lot about it. And this, uh, the blood shits were brought in early on after Eric Schilling, one of the original American volunteer group guys, he ended up going down uh, with engine failure in Southwest China, kind of in friendly territory. But I think one of the interesting things is that it's, that's really an ambiguous statement. What's friendly or enemy territory in uh, World War II China? He ends up with these tribesmen that uh, um, don't ha have obviously never seen a Caucasian before, are not super familiar with Mandarin either. These are the Yi people in Southwest China. And so they actually think that he is like a Japanese enemy airman of the type that's been bombing them. And uh, he, he ends up kind of imperiled for a little bit until they end up stumbling across a warning net station and this poor <laughs> radio operator there who also does not speak any English, happens to have a Chinese English dictionary and they kind of painstakingly communicate with each other one word at a time until they figure out what the situation is and they end up getting this guy back to safety. And so his case is more or less what prompted the, uh, the blood shits, which ends up being this like nine and a half inch tall piece of silk uh, that you see famously on the back of the flying jackets that says essentially this is a foreigner who's come to help China in the war uh, civilians and soldiers, everyone should rescue and protect him. And what's interesting is about the bloodshed is it makes no mention of any reward or compensation or anything like that. And in fact, the vast majority of people that helped Americans did not get compensated in any way. In fact, uh, they end up, uh, a lot of times facing pretty severe retaliation from the Japanese. Um, so there's no evidence that monetary rewards did anything. The blood shits were useful, even more useful than the blood shits were the pointy talkies that they came up with later, which had side-by-side -side phrases in English and Chinese. So you could 
ask questions, get answers to things, uh, be able to be more specific about your situation. Uh, those end up being more helpful. But in general, um, even without those tools, uh, the Chinese people were very willing to help regardless. So uh, whereas those were useful, I don't think they were causal in anybody helping anybody, if that makes sense. Um, good. I'm going to let people know we will probably wind this up very soon because you're a much later time zone than we are. And we really uh, appreciate your, your, your time with us this evening. Um, uh, I have a couple that may not really be focused on this. Someone asked about a, a movie, 1987, Buddha's Lock. Is that something? I don't know anything about that film myself. Have you heard of that? I have not. I was born in 1987. I don't know how that makes everybody feel. <laughs> about it I'm makes us feel great, Daniel, because it's all new <laughs> generation of expertise on this subject. That, um, as as you know, uh, they say in Portland, retire the uh, the the uh, uh, some of us older folks, which I did this last year, and we go off to try and, and do something in our retirement. It's great to know there's younger people, uh, you know, who actually have the kind of experience you do. Um, that um, uh, are carrying on this research and actually so involved in current investigations going on in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, I have a question from one of our board members, Jeffrey Kinkley, uh, and he's talking about a fellow named Robert Short, a pilot who was shot down in Suzhou in 1932 after a dogfight with the Japanese. So he's pre-Flying Tiger. I believe Robert Short was actually from Tacoma, Washington. But because he was shot down in the Suzhou area, there's um, pictures of him in the museum in Suzhou, our sister city. And I've seen those photos there as well as his story. Um, apparently there was also a monument to him that was taken down during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and of course the, the story of Robert Short is of some interest here, both in Portland and Tacoma. Um, any comments about, about him? Not him specifically, but I'll, I'll say that uh, there were monuments all over China uh, erected uh, throughout the war. And again, China defines the war in a much longer lens than the United States does. Uh, and it was Americans. There were actually uh, quite a few Chinese Americans that ended up going back to uh, receiving pilot training in the United States and going back to uh, China and uh, um, flying with the Nationalist Air Force uh, early in the war. Uh, some of them uh, became... Uh, uh, quite famous as as uh, aces in those early difficult days. You have the the Russians that helped. You have the international squadron uh, that Schnault attempted to put together. Um, but then uh, throughout the war, you have this these people creating monuments or uh, or headstones for graves, all kinds of stuff. Some of those are still around, but a lot of them were. Um, hidden or buried or destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. And so actually that's one of the things is that likely a lot of the Americans that are still missing were probably buried locally and we will just never be able to find those folks because those gravestones have been uh, destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, which is super sad. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a pretty common phenomenon at the time. So uh, because we are already quite over time, I'm going to ask that any other questions, you know, we'll try to retrieve by email uh, and answer those uh, after the event. Um, I think we can um, maybe uh, find out from you and perhaps include in our next newsletter uh, uh, some other questions about this whole story. So we'll be in touch with you, Daniel, as a follow up. And I do want to mention to our viewers that we have another book talk in June. The story of Bruce Lee by Doug Palmer. The registration for that is up on our website. So we encourage you to join us in June for another China chat. And, and, a, and he's a Northwest uh, author. And I do want to be in touch with you, Daniel, in the future. Uh, we won't bother you while you're studying for your PhD. We want you to see you to get that degree. And I think you deserve one for having written this book. Uh, but let us know how you're doing uh, with your dissertation <laughs> and any other projects. And we're gonna keep an eye out in the news as some of these remains uh, are transported back to the home uh, areas of, that they, of the individuals. And it's an ongoing story that, um, you know, we really appreciate you spending time with us tonight. 
to talk about your book and the overall ongoing projects that you're involved. So thank you very much. And with this, we'll say goodbye. And John will probably end the meeting for all of us here in just a second. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.